and what we're going to talk about is money uh, and kind of the the really core fundamental basics uh, that I think we don't talk enough about. So it's weird for me because talking about money and writing books about money now is my job, uh, which is very, very weird to me because for most of my life, believe it or not, I was absolutely absurdly terrible with money. If you think that you're bad with money, I promise you, I promise you I was worse. Um, I grew up in one of those families where you could, talk, you could talk about literally anything around the dinner table. You could make jokes about like farting or sex jokes. You could have a robust, uh, respectful conversation about religion or politics. Everything was allowed. But the one thing that we never, ever, ever spoke about was money. And so when I entered the adult world and I got my first job and very quickly got my first credit card, which just arrived in the post one day, I had this incredible financial strategy, which was just never think about it. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure it'll all work its way out and whatever. And spoiler alert, it wasn't fine by not understanding how money works, by not having these, these kind of really basic concepts that you understand, there's this ironic thing that happens where the less you understand about money, the more money ends up controlling your life. And that was certainly true for me. By having this very, you know, like ostrich approach to, to finances, and it was so bad, by the way, that I was that person who, when I would go and draw money from the ATM, I would get the slip and I would scrumple it up and throw it away without ever looking at it so that I didn't have to see how little money was in my bank account. <laughs> um, and at its worst, I managed to get myself into more than 300,000 rands worth of debt by my mid 20s. I don't even know who gave or offered a 20 something year old 300,000 rands worth of money. My brain wasn't fully developed yet. I certainly could not be trusted with these infinite credit cards. And yet I was. And things got worse for me when I, and, and one day I had this, this realization um, and I was about, I must have been about 25, 26. And I had this realization that I hated my job. I, was in a relationship that was making me really unhappy. And I felt like I couldn't leave either of those things because of my financial situation. And I'm really, really glad that that happened because that was the wake up call that I needed to get put on my my cowboy hat and confront this thing that I had seen as re I thought was really terrifying and I thought was uninteresting and I thought this is just not something I ever want to think about. I realized I had to, kind of had to. So I made learning about money my mission in life. I managed to sneakily uh, get myself a job inside the finance industry because I figured if you go into the belly of the beast, that's the best way to, to figure out how it actually works. Uh, so I ended up working in the finance industry and I, I, I did everything I could to learn these basic lessons about money. And what I learned was kind of nuts. It was kind of wild. And so I became really passionate about sharing those really surprising things that I learned while I was there with other young people, specifically young people. Here's, so here's the first crazy thing that I learned. It's to do with this very large number at the top, uh, 451 billion rand and some change. That is the amount of money that South Africans spent on gambling. And that is in one year alone. That is in 20, sorry, I'm busy checking my notes. That is 2019. They spent 451 billion rand in that one year. And 32 billion, that is the amount of profit that the gambling industry declared in that same one year. Nuts, right? And this is only legal gambling as well. So this excludes online gaming and it excludes all of those like dodgy things that your weird uncle is always trying to convince you to waste money on. And that was the first thing that I learned really was when I was walking around the world feeling like 
I missed something. There was a class at school one day about how money works and I must have been sick that day and I'm the only person who doesn't understand how money works and what I'm supposed to be doing. And I was feeling so ashamed of that and so scared of asking for help because I felt like I should just know all of this stuff. I realized that wasn't true. I realized that most people feel like they don't understand what they are supposed to be doing. And of course they don't, because we don't do a good job in South Africa or anywhere in the world really, teaching young people the basic principles of money. We just don't. And then we just assume everyone will sort of just figure it out on their own. And unfortunately, people are not figuring it out on their own. Time Bank uh, ran a study, uh, I think it was two, three years ago now, where they interviewed South Africans across the income spectrum. And they found that 76%, so that's three quarters of people, run out of money before the end of the month regularly. And in fact, more than half of people, 57%, run out of money by the 15th of the month. And if you think that that's just a problem of income, and certainly in, in our economy, that is often part of the problem is people just are not earning enough money. But that's not the only part of the problem, because in fact, if you just go and ask individuals who earn more than 50,000 Rand a month, which is the top 1% of income earners in South Africa, nearly half of them are running out of money before the end of the month, every month also. You can't really out earn not knowing what you are supposed to be doing, not feeling like you are in control of your spending. And it was really helpful to have this realization when I, I made it my job to start talking to people about money because it made me feel less alone. And the other thing that I learned, which was even more optimistic and even more hopeful, is that it's really not actually as complicated as I had been led to believe. This is the dark secret that most of the financial services industry doesn't really want us to understand. Because a lot of people, when they talk about how money works, they very quickly start talking about a bunch of complicated financial jargon. And they start talking about products and they start saying, oh, you know, you should know what a TFSA is and you should make sure that you've got a retirement annuity and you've got, you've got to think about stocks and bonds and all these different things and crypto and rah, rah. And they throw a lot of words at you. But the good news is that the fundamental principles, the things that really matter most, are really not that complicated at all. And that's, that's a really good thing. One of the biggest kind of mind flips, I think, happens when you start thinking about your money in a, a sort of fundamentally different way. Most of us, when we think about being good with our money, being in control of our money, what we're thinking about is just getting through from paycheck to paycheck. We think about, I have this amount of money left and I'm going to get paid again on the 25th and I need to get from here to there. And if I can just do that, and it's sort of like a trapeze, right? Or a uh, George of the Jungle swinging from vine to vine. If I can just do that and never miss a vine, that's okay, I'm coping. And many people aren't even able to do that. They're not even able to get through the month, right? But really what gets really powerful and can help you change how you feel about your finances in quite a different way is to take a step back from that month to month picture and to sort of just visualize all of the money that you're ever going to earn over your whole lifetime as a whole. So I want you to do that now. I want you to imagine this huge big pile of money. You can imagine it with like actual physical cash and you could imagine you could dive into it like this oak, like Scrooge McDuck and you could swim through it. And just imagine that big pile of money. And that is all the money that you are gonna earn between now and the rest of your life, right? Now the good news is that pile of money is probably bigger than you think it is. So what I want you to do is I want you to find at the top of this graph, the number that is the closest to your average monthly income. And on the left of the graph, I want you to find the number that is closest to the age that you are right now. And see where those two numbers meet, find that number. 
So that is that number is the amount of money that you will still earn over the rest of your life. It assumes a 6% increase every year for inflation, or you could, you could remove that and do some different maths, and it assumes that you work until the age of 65, right? So that's a big number. It's a bigger number than most people realize often. So that's the good news because every rand that you will ever earn is really a piece of possibility because you could do anything with it. Money is what we call fungible, which means you can turn the same rand into anything. You could turn it into a holiday, you could turn it into school fees, you could turn it into whatever you want. So you have a lot of choices. That's the good news, but the bad news is you don't really have a lot of time to make those choices in. So I'm not going to do a lot of math in the next hour, I promise. This is the, this is the, the last bit of math that we have to look at. Um, imagine that you work for 40 years. So you work from age 25 to age 65 and you get 12 paychecks every year and you never take a break. You never stop working. You work for that full 40 years. That means that you only have 480 paychecks over your whole lifetime. And really those are your moments to decide where all of that money is going to go. Because let's be honest, once the month goes on and money's in your bank account, it just tends to vanish, right? That happens to all of us. Which really means that you have 480 choices, 480 times to decide what you're going to turn all of that money that's going to flow through your life into what it's going to fund in your life right and the truth is that even though that pile of money might be big it might be bigger than many of us think about when we're stuck in our month to month cycle it's not infinite none of us are going to earn money forever if we're lucky many of us the reason that we will stop earning money is because we will get old and we will not be able to earn money anymore and we'll also hopefully deserve some some good calm downtime and the biggest flip that really helps people to start to feel more in control of their finances in my experience is thinking about how they can make sure that they can still pay for the things that they need even in times when that next paycheck is not there and that means thinking about that pile holistically. So really the goal is to think about how you can earn money during the times when you yourself are not earning money. And that's what assets are. Jobs are things where you go out and you use your labor and you go and create an income. Assets are things that you can buy that put your money to work so your money can make money for you, right? And that, my friends, is the single core, most important lesson about feeling in control of your money. Buy assets, build a portfolio of assets. That's it, that is the single most important thing to know. <laughs> Everything after this is how, how do we buy assets, right? I have a little story that I like to tell myself to really help me imagine what this looks like in my own life. And with the story, I like to imagine that I have all these little pets in my house and I call them snorkels and they're cute as heck. This is what they look like. And snorkels need to eat apples to survive. Every one snorkel needs one apple every day. Otherwise your snorkel will starve slowly and no one wants that because they're cute, right? So every day I have to go out to the fields and I have to go pick apples and I have to bring them back home so that I can feed my snorkels, right? And that's good and well, but there are times when I don't, I can't go do that. And there are times when I don't want to be doing that. So my goal is to rather start growing my own orchard of apple trees that I can laze around, I can play Xbox, I can teach my snorkels to hula hoop, and I don't have to go and pick apples every single day. Or it's not a disaster if there are days when I cannot pick apples. I think in the last year, all of us have confronted the fact that there are times when those paychecks dry up and that's not in our control. That's not about us having done something bad or wrong. That can happen to everyone. So the goal is lots and lots of apple trees, right? Simple. How do you do that? Three things. You save, you get out of debt, and then you start investing. You grow that money. Done, that's it. That's everything you need to do. <laughs> Obviously, it like it 
it's easier said than done. And the first part of, of the first step really, which is saving, is interesting to me because it is the easiest one to understand and it's the hardest one to do. Saving is a lot like running a marathon, right? It's not complicated. In order to know what you need to do to run a marathon, you don't need to go and get a degree in biokinetics. You don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to understand what proteins muscles are made of. All you have to do is you have to put running shoes on your feet and you have to actually go running every day until you get fit. <laughs> And saving is kind of the same thing. It's the easiest thing to understand, but it's so hard to do. <laughs> so what do I mean by saving? Saving just means creating a surplus, which is making sure that you have apples left over, that you have more apples coming in than your snorkels are eating, right? So back to the snorkels, snorkels are eating apples. You either earn extra apples, maybe you have a side hustle, maybe you get a long overdue raise at your job, or you put your snorkels on a diet and then you have a surplus. What you can do with that surplus is you can keep them aside so that you've got a bit of a spare cash if there's a day when you need some apples. And then once that pile is big enough that you've got emergency apples, you can then also start planting some of those apples, which is the investing side of things. Saving has to come first, right? But the reason that saving is so hard, right, is Everyone here is okay. I want to I need to start saving money. Fine. And then the first thing that we all think about is okay, I'm going to go and create this big long complicated spreadsheet called a budget and then I'm going to follow that budget and that budget is going to tell me that I am never allowed to eat sushi or buy coffee or do any of the things that are fun uh, and I just have to follow the spreadsheet and then great. Excellent. I'll have saved money. Problem solved, magic. <laughs> and of course, all of us who've tried creating a budget and just following it know that unfortunately they're very seldom effective. And the reason that they are very seldom effective is that we like to imagine that our brains are these perfect computers and you feed our brains instructions and then your brain just does what you tell it to do. And that's kind of what a budget is. It's like a set of instructions for your brain and then cool you just follow those instructions but the truth is that your brain is not a computer you have the brain of a primate right you are a primate with pants on that is all you are and your brain doesn't work like that and we set ourselves up to fail when we treat our brain like a computer instead of treating it like a brain which is this fallible thing and you've got to work with how your brain really works not pretend it's something that it isn't so instead of just trying to save by writing down how you want to be spending your money in an ideal imaginary world, which is often all budgets are, <laughs> try something that does actually work. So three of the tactics that are best supported by the data. So research shows that these things tend to be more effective than just trying to change your behavior. Um, the first one is just to make saving automatic, something that you don't think about. And this is that old idea called pay yourself first, which when I was in my 20s, I told myself meant that on payday, I could take myself shopping. That's what it meant to pay yourself first. Sadly, that is not what it means. <laughs> what pay yourself first means is on the day you get paid, have an automatic transaction that goes off your bank account so that that money goes off away into a savings account or an investment or paying off debt. So you never see it to begin with. It's gone before you get attached to it. It's just away. Um, the other thing to, to do is rather than focusing on all of those small, tiny things that often give you a lot of pleasure, uh, normally when we feel like we're our spending is out of control, we start off by thinking about the small things we do often right? Because we do it often so it feels like those are the things that matter. But really, if you look at where your money really does go, you'll find that for most people, there are three things that consume most of your spending. And that is where you live, how you get around, and what food you eat. Those three things. 
for some, for other people, school fees uh, can can play can be number four or even sometimes number number three. Um, but for most of us, it's those three categories. And if you just make one big change in one of those three categories, it is so much easier to free up a big chunk of money every month. That and it doesn't mean that you have to constantly feel bad every time you spend a little bit of money on something that makes you happy. So it can be much more effective to focus on the regular recurring bills in your life rather than the, the kind of fun money. But ironically, we always start with the fun money. And then the third thing that you can do is there's this funny thing our brains do called mental accounting, which is we think about different kinds of money as being different, right? So we think about money that we get from bonuses or from a side hustle as being free money. And that's money that we, we generally spend on nice things like holidays, right? But really what can be very helpful for a lot of people if you're struggling to find extra money to save is to just have a rule with yourself that you actually save 100% of any of that magical money. Because think about it, that is money that you were planning to do without already. So it can be very easy to just funnel that 100% into your savings. Or just in general to have rules for yourself that maybe it's not 100% because buying things is also nice, maybe it's 90%. But whatever it is, having these rules that certain types of money is just for saving. And that those are three things that, that can be easier for people. But a great way to start is to just start seeing where your money actually goes today. Uh, I used to work for a local app called 227. It's now a part of Old Mutual. And what it does is it's a totally free app. Uh, you can connect up all of your bank accounts, you can connect your investments, your credit cards, your store cards, even if you've got like a Edgar's account or whatever, you can put it in, pick and pay, cards, everything. And it can give you a full picture of where your money is actually going. So it'll categorize your transactions for you. So for example, uh, you know, if you spend money at KFC, uh, it'll say, cool, that's eating out. If you spend money buying the last pie at the garage, at 10 p.m., it'll say, cool, that's bad life choices. That's the diarrhea category. <laughs> so it gives you a picture for the first time of where your money actually goes. And we used to do a lot of research with people where we'd play these guessing games with them. So we would uh, ask them to write down where they think their spending goes. So we would say, what do you think you spend on eating out every month? What do you think you spend on petrol? And then we would get the real answer. <laughs> and people were often very surprised by the differences. And often in good ways. Like I think many people are surprised to learn how much of their money is going into these bills that or these subscriptions that you've forgotten about often uh, that aren't really bringing you joy. Um, and how much money is going into stuff like insurance, which is important, but a lot of people have too much insurance in South Africa, or it's been a while since we've gone and actually shopped around for cheaper insurance because it's a hassle. But when you see how much easier it is to control your spending with the, the boring monthly things than all the fun things for most people, it can be a great first thing to start. So if there's just one thing that you do after this evening, install an app that helps give you a picture of your true spending. It'll be insightful. Don't be like me, who was like an ostrich and just didn't want to know. <laughs> so saving is the most emotional part of the process um, because it's the part that's about controlling your behavior. So the good news is once you have confronted that step and you've dealt with all of those difficult feelings, Figuring out what to do with the surplus you've created, with all the money that you've freed up, that's actually pretty easy. <laughs> uh, it's not the complicated part. And it, it, it can be quite like step by step. And for many people, the, the, the next step after you have built up some savings and you have freed up a surplus every month, so you're saving every, consistently every month, is to start thinking about getting out of debt. So, we also we have this idea when we talk about debt often that people get into debt because of frivolous things because they weren't in control of themselves and you know they were just being silly 
And that is certainly sometimes true. It was definitely true for me. Um, but the most common reason that people get into debt, particularly in South Africa, is because they have unexpected uh, emergencies that come up and they don't have a savings cushion or they lose their job temporarily and don't have a savings cushion. And we talk about debt in this really morally loaded way. And it's part of what makes people feel so ashamed when they are struggling with debt. And that shame doesn't really help anyone because it just means that people like me who really needed help don't ask for help. So if you are struggling with a lot of debt, this is my permission to you to stop feeling bad about it and to just, just deal with it, just make a plan, right? It's okay, debt is not a moral failing. It's a consequence of our economic system. So what debt is, is and, and specifically how consumer debt works. I'm not talking about like house, house debt, debt to, buy, debt to buy a house. So go back to our lovely snorkels. What happens when uh, something happens and you can't go and pick apples for that day and you don't have any emergency apples in your savings pile? You have no choice but to go and borrow apples from your very creepy neighbor. I call her Murta and she's very mean. And she'll give you apples, that's fine. And then you, there's an IOU, right? So like if you borrow money from a friend, you can have some apples now, but you have to give them back to me later. That's not the problematic part. That, that kind of debt, which is more like how we often loan money to friends and family, that's, that doesn't cause debt spirals. What causes debt spirals is usually if Myrta, the person I'm, I'm borrowing apples from, is a bank or a it's a store card or it's a credit card or a personal loan or a mashonisa or anything like that. It comes along with this creature called interest. So Murta says, I'll loan you these apples, but you now have to adopt my pet too. And my pet is the interest monster. It's a bit gross. It's fine. The problem is that the interest monster also needs to eat apples and it grows. And the longer that you keep it, the bigger it gets. And the bigger it gets, you still only have the same amount of apples every day. And eventually the interest monster is eating all of your apples and there's nothing left for your own snorkels. And that is a death spiral when that interest monster is growing faster than you are able to keep up with its growth by the picking more apples. And in South Africa, what that often looks like is uh, people end up who end up spending 60 to 70% of every paycheck just paying their interest. So that's a real stat from Debt Busters, which is one of the biggest uh, debt counseling services in South Africa. So by the time a customer comes to them and asks for debt rescue, on average, it, it's 64% of their income, their paycheck is going just towards paying their debt, keeping up with their debt, which means they're now living off 36% of every paycheck, which is really, really hard. And that's why debt spirals are so dangerous for people, specifically when we're talking about high interest debt. The other thing about carrying debt is, if the goal, we keep our eyes on the prize, which is the goal is to grow lots of beautiful apple trees, to have lots of assets so that you can, you know, feed your snorkels, even in times when you can't go pick apples, carrying debt erodes that whole plan. And that's because of something quite simple, which is that, if you go to the bank and you ask for a credit card, the interest rate that they will make you pay on it is about 18% usually. And if you go to the same bank and you say, here's my money, would you pay me interest on this if I keep it in a savings account with you? They will typically give you what, like 4%? And the difference between 18% and 4% is the reason that bankers drive nicer cars than you do. That gap is why bankers make so much money. And the thing is, if you are sitting on debt, almost always the best investment you can make is paying off your debt first. And again, this only applies when I'm talking about high interest debt. So that's stuff like credit cards and store cards, right? But there is no investment on earth that can guarantee growth of 18% every year. And that's the growth that you get by paying off your debt. So the really thrilling thing about paying off your debt is 
you know, if you've had debt, you're used to living on a small chunk of your paycheck. So you are used to creating a surplus and paying, once you've paid it off, you can really start to grow your money in the future and you can free yourself from paying for stuff you bought in the past and you can start focusing on growth. But you can't start focusing on growth if you are carrying debt because it makes no sense to be investing in something that might be giving you 12 or 13% growth as an investment if it's losing value on your debt faster. See what I'm saying? So get out of debt. You don't need it. Your life is better without it, I promise. Once you've done that, you can start doing the really fun part, which when before I knew anything about how money works, I assumed was the difficult and boring and scary part. And now I know is the fun and also incredibly simple part and very satisfying. So you want to get to this step as quickly as you can. And that is starting to invest. I used to think that investing was something that just wasn't relevant to people like me. Investing was something that you had to worry about if you were like, I don't know, some swanky oak living in Sanson and, or I don't know, you had a yacht and you would read the business news on your yacht and you'd listen to Bruce Whitfield every day. I love Bruce. He's great. But like, you know, no one wants to be listening to business news every day. Some people like Simon, I think, find it interesting. Many of us do not. <laughs> so for a long time, I was just like, well, investing just doesn't apply to me. It's only for people who really know a lot about business and are interested in business. But the truth is all of us have to figure out how investing works. And the reason is that keeping your money just in a regular savings account, ironically, is the most reliable way to make it lose value. And the reason is not because of, you know, like little kleptomaniac tokoloshes who are like living under your bed, eating all the savings you've got stashed under your mattress. The reason is because of inflation. And all inflation means is that your money is worth less every single year. So the 10 Rand that today can buy you a can of Coke in 20 years time will only be able to buy you half of that same can of Coke, probably even less, right? That's what inflation is. So we have to invest to just preserve the value of our savings over time. It's something that all of us have to have to wrap our heads around. And the other thing about investing that, that makes it relevant to all of us is that most of us who are alive today will, if we're lucky, statistically, live a very long time. And it's very difficult to keep working in a job after the age of 65. It's not fair, but that is the world that we live in. Most people who lose their jobs between the ages of 60 and 65 find that they cannot find another job even when they want to, right? So the reality for many of us is that we are likely, on average, to live for often almost as many decades after we're retired as we worked before our retirement. Now imagine that. So imagine you live for 30 years after you retired from 65 to 95, which is very feasible for many people alive today, statistically. That is almost as long as many people's working careers. So imagine that every paycheck you get, you have to fund one month of your life now and one month of your life after you retire. Imagine you had to always live off half of every paycheck. It would be really difficult. Now, the good news is if you can invest smartly, you don't have to do that. You can get some of that extra money that you need by investing in that extra growth, right? So that you don't have to like, I don't know, live on salty cracks and two minute noodles now. That's the goal. So investing just means buying assets. And assets is like this complicated term, but all of us instinctively really understand what assets are, I think. So let's talk about a cow. A cow is an asset and it's a, it's a very popular type of asset in a lot of South Africa. And I think we all understand how a cow can increase in value. You can buy it as a small baby cute cow with cute little eyes and you can feed it. And then when it's big, you can murder it and then you can eat it. Uh, or you can make it produce milk and you can sell its milk, right? So we understand a cow is a really good asset. A cow produces value. I don't have a cow, I have a cat. Um, I have tried selling his meat. No one is interested in buying it. The cats are terrible, terrible assets. 
Well, the problem with cows, obviously, is uh, they are, I don't know if you've seen a cow, but they're very big and I don't have room for them in my house. They also poop a lot and then you end up with cow dung on everything and it's stinky. No one's really got time to own cows. And that is why the type of asset that I am most unironically enthusiastic about is the stock markets. And to be perfectly honest, I didn't actually know what the stock market was until my mid twenties. So if you don't know, don't worry about it. I will tell you what it is. So I want you to imagine that you go to the pick and pay or you go to the shop, right? So you can picture a shop with shelves, except I want you to imagine that in this shop, you can buy literally every type of product that the world makes. You can buy cannabis oil, you can buy cat food, shoes, you can buy cart, like gallon drums full of uh, petrol, anything that the world makes, you can buy it in the shop. Now, all the stock market is, is the stock market is that shop, except instead of buying the products, you, up, you can buy very, very tiny pieces of the companies that make those products. So instead of buying a laptop, made by Apple, you can buy a very, very tiny piece of Apple, the company. And that is what the stock market is. It is a virtual market. It used to be a real place in specific cities. Now it's all on the internet. So it's more like superbolist than like pick and pay. Um, does superbolist still exist? Side note. <laughs> um, but the great thing is that as a person sitting in South Africa, it is very, very easy, as easy as shopping online and buying jeans, to buy tiny, tiny pieces of the biggest companies in the world. So all of the brands that you already know and you already love, you can sit in on the loo with your phone and you can buy tiny, tiny pieces of those companies. And you can often do so now with very, very small amounts of money. So it's really cool. There are two ways that your money can grow by uh, buying shares. The first one is uh, what we call dividends. So if you think back to the cow, the, if your cow produces milk and you go and sell that milk, that's equivalent in the stock market to a dividend. It's just a boring name for it's the profit, right? So when Apple sells lots of computers, uh, they make a profit they can either reinvest that profit back in their business or they can pay it back to its shareholders. And if you own one one hundred thousandth of Apple, you will get one one hundred thousandth of the profits that Apple distributes. And those are called dividends. And they're awesome, right? Similar to the milk, because you still own the underlying thing. You haven't killed your cow. But if you do want to rather go and kill your cow or rather just sell your cow to someone else, you don't own it anymore, you, you sell it and hopefully you sell it for more money than you bought it for, that in the world of investing is usually called a capital gain. They're fancy words, but if you come back to just remembering what the underlying thing is and what you are doing with those businesses, I think it's actually pretty easy to understand. Now, here's the problem with buying and selling shares on the stock market. Some people find it really, really fun. They, they, they like trading. They like reading the business news. They like looking at the, the price graphs and figuring out, you know, is it going to be smarter for me to buy Burger King or McDonald's? Who's going to do better? But if you're like me and you just don't know much about businesses and you don't want to know much about businesses because you, you like doing other things, the good news is that you don't have to. In fact, for many people, the best way to start investing on the stock market is so absurdly easy that it almost feels like it shouldn't be allowed, but it is. And that's called buying a product called an ETF. Again, finance people give things terrible names, but it's really, really easy. What an ETF is, is imagine you go to this stock market shop and you take every single company that's on the shelves, all of them, just like Reggie's rush your way through the stock market and you just stick it all in a trolley. And you go home and you put all of those little pieces of companies into a big blender and you blend it up and then you make a smoothie. And that smoothie contains tiny, tiny, tiny pieces of Coca-Cola, of oil companies, of everything, right? That smoothie is now an ETF. It's 
a blend of pretty much everything that you can buy usually. So you can get ETFs that are truly global. So they they go to the all the world stock markets, all the big ones, and they put everything into one smoothie. Or you get ones that are local. So you can get something that just is the South African business smoothie. And that's an ETF. And the cool thing about an ETF is it is really diversified, which is a fancy way of saying you haven't put all of your eggs in one basket. You can have a whole global pandemic even and not every business is going to fail. Some businesses like tech businesses have done really, really well. So the great thing about spreading your money across thousands of businesses means that it's much less likely for something to go horribly, horribly wrong. So this is why they're a great investment for most people. There are lots and lots of different ETFs. Some of my favorites locally are, there's a Satrix Top 40. You've probably heard of that one. What that means is it is just the 40 biggest companies on South Africa's stock market in a business smoothie. That's all it is. Or you can get something like the MSCI World, which is the global version of that. It's like all of the companies. And there are ETFs in every country that you want to invest in. Um, but for many people, the easiest thing to do is to just buy a South African one that is a smoothie of companies all around the world. Because by doing that, you are making sure that all of your risk is not attached just to South Africa. You're like, it, something has to go wrong in Taiwan and South Africa and England and America and everywhere else at the same time for you to lose your money and that's unlikely. And the good news is that for most people, this really lazy way of investing actually works out better than trying to do that intense trading. Trading can be really fun and it can make you a lot of money if you know what you are doing. And if you don't want to invest all of that time, great way to start, just start buying ETFs, business smoothies. And you can literally do that with as little as 20 Rand. And you can start today and you should. <laughs> um, now, on average, uh, the South African stock market has grown at about 7.2% every year. And what's cool about this number is that we have over 100 years worth of data about this. So investing in stock market can be a bit scary because in the short term, the price is really, really wobbly. Today, something will be worth 100 Rand and tomorrow it'll be worth 200 Rand. And then the next day, it'll be worth 50 Rand and it just jumps around all over the place. But on if you zoom out, the money tends to kind of go back to the normal growth rate, right? So investing in ETFs is not for money that you need tomorrow. It's not for money that you need three months from now. It's best suited for money that you, where you can wait at least five years because then those short-term wobbles don't matter. Over the long term, there's no other type of investment that is performed as well as equities that we have this much data for. So it's a really good place for most people to start off with. And at about 7.2%, what that means really is that your money doubles about every decade, right? Which can, can be powerful. Sorry, this is, I forgot to say this, which is just that, um, the stock market has performed much better than many other types of assets in South Africa and especially residential property buying houses on average for most people. But that is a whole side side thing. Let's not get into that. Okay, so investing in the stock market is cool. Uh, your money can double about every 10 years. Why is this great? This is great because of a little thing called compound interest. Compound interest is also probably something that you've heard of before, but it can be really hard to understand exactly how powerful it is until you see it in action. So to see it in action, I'm going to stop talking about money for a second because that's boring. And instead, I want to talk to you about vampires, which is my true passion, honestly. So have you ever noticed that in vampire TV shows and movies and books, vampires always live in mansions and they always wear fancy waistcoats and they're drinking good wine. In other words, vampires are always loaded, right? They are rich. And have you ever stopped to wonder why that is? And the answer is compound interest. And what this means is when you invest money, it doesn't grow just in a straight line. 
what happens is that it grows in a curved line, a lot like COVID does, is kind of like a terrible analogy. So if you have 100 Rand and you invest it and it doubles after 10 years, which is on average what it does in the stock market, then imagine you have two little pockets of that same 100 Rand, right? If it doubles again, both of those 100 Rand notes that you now have double. So, and then imagine it keeps doing that. Now that's exponential growth. It's not, it's not as easy as just the original thing doubles every two years. And to see why that's so powerful, I want you to imagine that 200 years ago, Edward Cullen, Dream Bay, uh, went to Capitec Bank and all he had with him was he had one 200 Rand note and he put it in a Capitec savings account earning 6% interest, uh, which is more than Capitec will give you these days, but a couple of years ago they were giving you 6%. And then he forgets about it for 200 years. Now, if Capitec didn't exist 200 years ago, neither did South African Rands, but just go with it, right? If you invest 200 Rand and it grows at just 6% interest, but you leave it for 200 years, what that turns into today is 1 billion Rand. Just think about that, 1 billion Rand. That's crazy. And that is because of the power of compounding. And the thing about compounding is, and, and all money that you invest pretty much grows in this compounded way. And what it means is, what matters more than any other variable is how long you leave it alone for. That matters more than how much you start with. It even matters more than how fast it grows. The variable that is the most powerful is time. And you might be thinking, well, I'm not an immortal blood-sucking demon. This doesn't apply to me. But the thing is it does, because there is a reason that you will want to invest for a very long period of time. And it's the one that we spoke about right at the beginning. One day, hopefully, you will retire. And compounding is a superpower when it comes to saving for your retirement. You might have seen this graph before, and forgive me if you have, because I think it is one of the most important things that I saw when I learned was, was learning about money. And it's this graph that compares two different people. Person A, let's call her Bella, for lols. I want you to imagine that Bella starts saving for retirement when she is 25, and she saves 1,000 Rand every month, and she does that for five years until she's 30. So age 25 to age 30, 1,000 Rand a month. And then she stops. She never saves another cent for her retirement. So in total, I think she saved 60,000 Rand over that five years, never saves another cent. Now compare Bella to Edward, who does exactly the same thing, also saves a thousand rand a month for five years, and he just starts five years later. So he starts at age 30 and he saves until age 35, saves the same amount of money. Now, Bella's savings by the time she's 65 are gonna have grown to almost a million rand because of compound interest. Awesome. And now it seems like Edward, it, sh it shouldn't matter that much that he just started five years later, but it does. It turns out that it's a difference of nearly 300,000 Rand, which is almost a third of the final amount that you end up with. And it's much, much more than the total amount of money that he saved. And this fact, this truth about compound interest, is why I'm so glad that you decided to spend this time here right now, this evening. When I was young, the biggest mistake that I made about money was I told myself that this could be future me's problem. Because I told myself, you know what, I'm young, I'm having fun, uh, I'm not earning a lot of money right now, let me wait until I'm 30 or 35 and I'm a proper adult and I've got more money and then it'll be easier, then I will start saving, then I will start growing my orchard of apple trees. But that is not how money works. You only have 480 choices, moments to choose what is gonna happen with all the money that is gonna flow through your life. And because of compound interest, it is those early paychecks that matter the most, which means that every month that you delay starting this process, it's not just the extra 100, 100 rand or 1,000 rand that you might have saved in this month that you're losing out on. It's 
all of the money that that little amount of money would have doubled up and doubled up and doubled up into by the time you retire that you're wasting. So it is so important to start. And starting is not as hard as you think. Well, it's hard, but it's not complicated. <laughs> you already know everything that you need to know to get started. The most important first step is just to start saving. Figure out how to create a surplus so that you have more money coming in every month than you have going out. Once you do that, everything else is simpler. You already know what you need to do. You just now need to go and do it. And I, it is worth doing and it is not that scary. And I am rooting for you to do it. And if you want more extra goodies and bonuses, uh, go check out my website, which is davidbessinger.com. And there are a bunch of things on there, like uh, a detailed guide for getting out of debt, if that's what you need, um, a, a recommendations for apps to go and install. I hope that this last hour has given you an idea for one action you could take. It's more important to just start doing it than to stay stuck wondering and worrying. And that's it from me. Yeah, so, uh, and I'm never going to get that vampire out of my mind. <laughs> Why are vampires rich? Of course, I, it, they always are. They wear the most swag swag. I mean, it's insane. A couple of points. They coming, do. They, they do. They, they, they're proper in that sense. Sean's commenting uh, costs compound similar. Sean, 100%. Uh, hence, Sam mentions ETFs. You know, you, you're coming in with costs there. At Satrix 40 is 0.1%. And I've told the story often about my first uh, first unit trust, which I think was 5% plus performance fees. So costs are hugely important and hence ETFs. I mean, I think the expensive ETFs in our market are about 0.8. So they absolutely are, are, are quite cheap. So I'm a great question coming it's from... It's such a no-brainer. Yeah, from, from uh, Luzani Gugu. And, and, and the comment is, is that uh, they're actually... The, the, what they return is slightly better than the, the cost of their debt, which is unusual. It's usually the other way around. But they're commenting that they still yep. want to pay off the debt because it's, frankly, it stresses them. And, and my response to that is, you know what? Sleep well at night. Pay the debt. I don't like debt either. We were chatting off air before we went on. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you have a phobia around debt and it's not a bad phobia to have and if it causes you stress, the spreadsheet might say one thing, but do what makes you comfortable. I couldn't agree enough. And people ask me this question all the time. And it often comes up with people who um, owe money, the, the, where it comes up the most intensely is where people owe money to friends and family. And often those agreements are interest free. So if you if you run that through the spreadsheet, exactly, the spreadsheet says, you know what, like rather invest and wait on this debt. But for me, I think the most, the biggest change in how I've thought, I think about my money now is understanding that my money is finite and limited and so is my lifetime, right? So it's really important to not waste money. I don't hate spending money. I love spending money, but I hate wasting money. And for me, you're wasting money when you are funneling it into things that doesn't add to your happiness. And paying off debt might be one of those things for you that adds enormously to your happiness because it adds to your peace. And that's worth doing. Like it's impossible to give general advice about what you should spend your money on because everyone values different things. But what I encourage everyone to do is make sure that you are being thoughtful about what you are spending your money on and you are actually putting your money into what you value. And if what you value is relationships, sleeping well at night, totally pay off your debts. No, I agree 100%. It's about being comfortable. Martin makes a great point, and Martin's point is, you know, how do we how do we get everyone to hear the message? And Martin, there's good news and there's bad news. The the the, the bad news is is that let's be clear, uh, corporates, uh, governments, the world over, um, are, are not spreading this message. In fact, governments are pretty much doing the opposite of everything that Sam says, and that they're spending our future money and uh, they're not saving, and they are the worst to 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 follow. That means the responsibility mm -hmm. falls on us. And I, I talk about, I, I do presentations to the JC Schools Challenge, and I talk about the responsibility of knowledge. When we know something, we need to go and 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 talk about it and tell peeps about it. There is one trick, however, with I suppose any knowledge, but you know, mine is about money. 
you can't talk to someone about it who doesn't want to listen. It's as simple as that. You know, you you the cliche, you can lead the horse to the water, but if that horse don't want to drink, there's nothing you can do. You can kind of plant seeds and then wait for people to come back mm -hmm. to you and, and engage them. Uh, Sam's got two great books, one for adults, one for kids. Um, there's content out there, but kind of let it be known that when people have questions, you're the go-to guy for those questions. Do you know, for, it was so amazing for me becoming someone, so, you know, I grew up in a family that just never spoke about money because, and, and bless my parents for this, their intentions were good. It's because they found money really scary. So they wanted to protect us from ever having to worry about it. Um, but, you know, it had this terrible consequence of therefore we just, you know, we're clueless. Um, and what I do now is I like make up for this by, I talk about money all the time. I have no scam. I tell people everything about my money. Um, and what's incredibly powerful is that once I started doing that, other people started telling me about their money problems. So I found that that's really powerful as well as just start being really open and honest with the people in your life about the things that are worrying you, but also the trade-offs that you are making. Like, oh, I'm choosing to downgrade my, my flat because I am doing this with it instead. And, you know, talk about those things. And that is an invitation you'll find to other people to start opening up to you. And, and few people feel like they can talk about money. So when they find someone that they can talk about money to, they're often very excited to do so. Yeah, no, this is true. A, a, a bunch more coming through. Uh, Julia, you worried about uh, 22 7 and sharing details with Old Mutual. Um, I remember when it came out, I, I know folks who were involved in the process. Uh, your stuff is safe. I mean, they, they, you know, at worst, what they might do is give Old Mutual your, your, your email address to phone you, but that hasn't even happened to me. I signed up. Was it 2012, 2011? It came out around mid-year. Um, they, 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 old mutual's got. They, they're not going to suddenly start uh, uh, peeking in. I mean, it, it's just not in their interest. Um, truthfully, our finances are never that particularly interesting anyway. Uh, here's my favorite. Uh, <laughs> I will say that. Yeah. So Oh, so just a quick thing on that, like, I, so I absolutely, I will also, as someone who worked there, can tell you that it is really secure, but I do really respect that you are skeptical because yes. you should be skeptical <laughs> be whenever skeptical. anyone asks for your money. Well done for asking the question. <laughs> yeah, be afraid. Be very afraid. Uh, Sam, here's one that's going to bless your heart. Uh, I'm 10 years old and I would like to invest my savings. What do you advise? <laughs> Forget starting at 25. I love you. 25 is an amateur. <laughs> buy a 3d switch no um that's that's super exciting i'm so so pleased that you are here um i wish i had started investing when i was 10. Uh, a very one of the richest men in the world warren buffett started investing when he was 11. so yes, you already ahead of have a head start. <laughs> well then um and my advice to all newbie investors is the same um which is try one of these business smoothie products but what i would suggest if you're 10 is Easy Equities, which is this really cool local website, uh, has a demo account. So you can go on there and you can start off playing with imaginary play play money, which is a good way to just, a good thing to do until you feel comfortable and you understand what's happening um, and do get an adult to help you, help you open a real account. But it would be the same advice for everyone else. You're investing for a very long time because you're 10. You are basically a vampire. You have forever for your money to grow. So definitely put it into something like a, a good business smoothie product like I spoke about would be my suggestion. Yeah. Um, and you're a year ahead of Warren Buffett. And I think he's the fourth richest man in the Yeah, anyway, in the top 10 is good enough for me. Um, <laughs> oh, but do save some cash to buy me a Ferrari later, because if you're starting now at 10, you are going to be so rich. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to be so rich. A uh, bunch of, of comments coming through about uh, it should be part of schools. Uh, some people love your book. No surprises there. Uh, tons coming through. Uh, question about the SAB, BEE shares. Uh, is it worth investing? Lawrence, short answer, yes, there might be a bit of a price spike as everyone rushes in. Um, a couple of points I'll make is obviously individual stocks. So there's a little more risk than that smoothie that Sam spoke about. Um, but what I like about BEE shares is you get them at a little bit of a discount. And, and I've never met a discount I didn't like. There's no certainties in life. I mean, could people en masse stop drinking beer? 
mean, they could, right? I mean, we'd never heard of pandemics a year ago, so it is possible. Uh, but yeah, I, I do. I, 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 I like it. I actually did a podcast about it. Uh, it's out this morning. You'll find it on just one lap. So my question, Charlie de Luck, is there a, such a thing as good debt? Yeah, definitely. Um, I So when you are able to use debt to buy an asset, and you, it's always a bit scary to do that because you are consolidating your risk and leverage increases your risk like astronomically in math ways that are weird. Um, but if you are using debt to buy something that you really, really value that you do think is going to grow in time, then sure, it can be good. So specifically, I think that often uh, student loans, if you are very thoughtful about why you are studying what you are studying and you are very realistic about how that will increase your earnings, I think that can be a really good form of debt. Um, specifically in South Africa, we have NF INFIS loans. Uh, yes. <laughs> we hope one day fees will fall, but until they have, NFSEA INFIS loans, are fantastic. They are really low interest rate loans. Great type of great type of loan. Um, I think in certain cases, taking out loans to start a business, if you are able to somewhat protect your personal assets or are comfortable about the realistic risks you are taking on, that can be good debt. It's very hard for many people to start businesses without debt. Your other option is to bootstrap, which is what I did when I started a business because I am terrified of debt. Um, and Debt to buy a house mathematically often comes out as kind of neutral as long as you stay in that house for at least 10 years on average in South Africa. It usually works out that buying a house that you fund with debt will work out over time to being sort of equivalent to what you would have paid on rent if you would have paid the same amount of rent. So you're not using the debt as an excuse to buy more house than you would have otherwise. Yeah. Um, so those are three specific times. Simon, is there anything you would add to no, that? No, that's what I would have added to it. I mean, education definitely. And, and even not always necessarily as an 18-year-old or as a 10-year-old. Maybe you're 40 and you want to re-educate yourself or you know, get ahead. Be realistic. I take Sam, Sam's point. Uh, a house, but don't do... My wife and I moved to Joburg. We'd been living in a one-bedroom house in the hills of KZN because it's just the two of us, a couple of dogs and some cats and a horse, but the horse had a stable. And we came to Joburg and the bank gave us a loan. So we basically made the house fit the loan, which we then had four bedrooms. And there were still only two of us and a couple of dogs and a cat, and the horse still had its own stable. A last question, because we have hit time and because I don't have a very good answer. Emmanuel is asking... How do you money, manage money in a relationship? I'm more conservative while my wife is carefree. So in my case, my wife is the conservative one. She would not spend a dime if she could. Uh, I'm the carefree one. I, I, I mean, I don't know. Same relationships are tricky. Throw money into that pot. I, so I, I actually, I encourage you to go onto my website and I wrote a, a a long blog post about this topic about a month ago. So I would encourage you to read that. Um, I think that we often think that, sorry, my uh, thingy keeps falling over. Um, we often think that money should be unemotional and we should be unemotional about money. But the reality is that when you're talking about managing your money, you're talking about quite deep questions about what do you value? What does a good life look like? So, you know, someone like Simon who is more carefree, that is that means that you value experiences, you value those things in your life. And so money is always going to be a part of any relationship because when you are arguing about money, you are often really arguing about values and you're arguing about quite deep questions. Um, so I think I don't have a, a quick answer, but the lo the the long answer is it is worth being very thoughtful about what you are actually um, talking about when you talk about money. And a very practical first step for many people is to make a financial plan together. Um, that is the expression of both of your goals. Often that plan, you're just going to throw it away, but the process of making that plan together and the conversations that it can open up can be really powerful and helpful. Yeah, I that. A great answer. That, that's why Sam Thaboffin, go to the website, sambeckmessenger.com. Quick, I'm going to quickly run through. Uh, would you pay off your car as soon as possible? Uh, yes, ish. I mean, again, it depends how it stresses you. Uh, balloon payments, I hate. 
But yeah, a car that's not too expensive, and as long as it's not like the Ferrari, which someone's going to be buying Sam at some point. Uh, we've got a 15-year-old. Should it go local or offshore? You know what? At this point, you're 15. You're starting. You're so ahead of the curve. Local or offshore is not really going to be the issue. Sipu, you worried about unit trusts. If you're worried about the price, things go up and down, as Sam says, in the short term. You zoom out, they go up. Uh, if you're worried about what's in them and the costs and the like, I, 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 I'm not the biggest fan of unit trusts. They're a giant industry. Um, but if you, again, to the point, when you're you know, we, we're not, we, we live in the future. And if something makes you uncomfortable, we'll change it. We, we, we can. And there might be a little bit of a cost associated. Maybe you've made some money in there's tax, uh, but, but rather sleep well at night. That's always the important point. Julia, when does Monday podcasts come back? Yeah, in time. I, I can promise you, I have not forgotten. I have not neglected. I have not abandoned. I have just not found the answer. But I'm young and I'm patient. Well, I'm not so young, but I'm patient. I, I promise I will. Um, the other 90%. Uh, and then uh, Sam asking what happened to your podcast? Uh, basically, it was taking up so much time. And so I have ADD, right? So I basically have to, I can only motivate myself by doing new things all the time. Uh, the podcast was a really fun experiment. Um, and I am now doing other things, I guess. I if someone if we can find a sponsor, I think we will make another season at some point. Um, I do still have a podcast that I do with one of my best friends, Simon Dingle, uh, about once every two months called Take Back the Day, which is about productivity. It's not about uh, adulting. Um, but thank you for that question because that tells me that someone listened to the podcast, which is always good to know. <laughs> no, the podcast was epic. And I love the one that you and Simon Dingle do, Take Back the Day. And what I love almost most about it is it's completely random. It just pops into my feed. None of this, when I do a podcast, I'm ADD, <laughs> but I go the other way. I'm also OCD. So when I release a podcast, it's released Monday, 1230, every Monday, Christmas Day, New Year Day. No, no, not you in the dingle. You just randomly drop this thing no, in. No, just basically whenever we can get our shit together. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I'm going to leave it there. We've done all the questions. We've run our time. Uh, huge thanks to the JC for facilitating. Uh, and massive, massive. Sam, you're absolutely epic. You're awesome. We appreciate you coming back. Thank you hugely. Uh, and to everyone who stayed and attended, really, and came back a second time to hear Sam Beck-Bessinger. Uh, really, huge thanks to everybody.